Good morning. You might open your Bibles up to the place that call your red force in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, and that's where we'll take our study from today. Well, normally I don't have a lot of personal remarks right before uh, my sermon, but today is a weird day. Um, and the next time you see me, I will not, well, I won't have this fine scalp that I have right now. They'll have done some work on it. Um, we are headed to Memphis tomorrow. Um, and uh, as Austin may mention, they'll be doing scans and tests on Tuesday and on Wednesday. They will do the day long procedure. Uh, the most dangerous part of all that is Lydia getting me to Memphis, I think. Um, but <laughs> I, uh, if we may get through that, I think we'll be okay. Um, no, be, being the one driven around and not the driver is a big transition. It's like I had a, I've got a brain tumor and I have to let my wife drive all the time. So <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I know which is worse. But anyway, um, I am so thankful for you. Um, I don't. I can't imagine that everywhere or anywhere is like here. Um, and, and you have been so, so good to us. And you have already made plans and preparations for what it will look like after this week and trying to take care of us. And we are so thankful for that. And you have shed lots of tears on our behalf and have prayed lots and lots of prayers on our behalf. And, um, you know, what, what that's going to turn out to be I don't know, but we can rest that it is in God's hands and we know that he is capable to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And we know because of the cross that he loves us more than more than we know. And with those two things in, in mind, his power and his compassion for us and your prayers calling upon him, then we will we will trust whatever whatever comes. And um, somebody this week at leadership camp was talking about uh, the book of Job. And Job says, though he slay me, I will trust in him. And I hope that we can say that with the same, same sense that Job was able to. I want to talk about some of that. I don't want to talk right on the nose about all of that this morning, because you're not all facing those sorts of things today. But I do want to talk about thinking about uncertain days ahead and how we can make the most of whatever time that we have. And I think that Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1 are as, as on point for thinking about those kinds of things as there are. And Lydia asked me what I was going to preach on this morning and thinking about what was coming up. And I said, you know, I'd really like to sort out that whole sons of God, daughters of men thing in Genesis 6. And she said, really? And I said, yes. I mean, I just, that just really bothered me. I'd like to get that sorted out before I go under the knife. And she couldn't believe it. But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. But in Philippians 1, Paul says that his utmost concern, and, and thus, because it was his utmost concern, what he knew his life or his death would accomplish was Christ's glory. That Christ would be glorified. Uh, that he would be, the New American Standard says, that he would be exalted in his body, whether by life or by death. The English Standard says that he would be honored in his body, whether by life or by death. The, the legacy standard that I've been reading from, that he would be magnified by my body. Now, I, I will say this, that there is one sense in which you and I cannot do anything to add or detract from Christ's glory. I can't make him larger than he is or honor him more than he is honored in heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. He has seraphim swirling around singing holy, holy, holy and, and, and have been from all eternity and will from all, for all eternity. But there is another sense by which in our words and deeds... We honor Christ. We exalt Christ. We magnify Him. We glorify Him. We make Him large. We exalt Him and we point people to Him. We declare Him to be great. And so, and so Paul says that's going to happen. Paul says, in my life, in my body, I'm going to make Christ large. I'm going to magnify Him. I'm going to exalt Him. I'm going to honor Him. I'm going to put Him, display Him for the world to see, whether I live or die. And, um, and, and in verse 19, it, it almost seems to suggest, and maybe there's some other things in the text to suggest this, and I'll point those out too, 
it almost seems to suggest that he says that he's going to be released, right? So he says, I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But then immediately in verse 20, he says, by life or death. So I don't know that Paul necessarily means in verse 19 that his salvation or his deliverance necessarily means that he will be delivered from prison. And we'll talk more about that later. Now, verse 25, and convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and join the faith. I want to say just a word about that. It, it may be that Paul has some insight here as to the way things are going in Rome and to God's purposes for sure and to the work of their prayers. And so he just feels like this is a time where I will be released. But, you know, I don't, I don't think that let's say it's four or five or six years later when Paul is in prison again, I don't think he's any less useful to the cause then. And at that point, he does not express the same confidence that he's going to be released. And we're going to look at that passage when he talks about that in 2 Timothy some at the end of the lesson. But I just I think that what Paul says here is not dependent on whether or not he gets out of that Roman jail as he writes here in the book of Philippians but rather that he is, he is confident that in some way he will be delivered. Whatever way things come to pass, that Christ, in whatever way things come to pass, that Christ will be glorified. I, I, I'm, I'm struck by what he says in, in verses 12 and following, and I appreciate, Carl, you're going back and doing the reading that far, because what he says is, Brethren, my circumstances have worked out for the greater progress of the gospel. And I don't think any of us would look at Paul's circumstances and think that they could be just summarized so briefly and, and almost minimized, right? Like, you know, my circumstances have, been, have worked out. His circumstances were severe suffering, long-term unjust imprisonment, failure to be able to get an honest hearing for his case for a long time. And now he just basically summarizes all that up and says, my circumstances, because his focus is not on the circumstances, but on how they've worked out for the greater progress of the gospel. And, and that we could be more like that. That we could look at all the ways and that in the midst of difficult circumstances, we would see the ways that God is working for the greater progress of the gospel. That that would be our focus, that, that people would be drawn to Christ. And, and in the middle, and, and Paul's in the middle of all that. Right? It's not on the other side of it, thinking back and saying, yeah, God really did use that. But right in the middle, saying, this has worked out for the greater progress of the gospel. And, and in order to see that, you've got to be looking for it. Because if you're not looking for it, then it's very easy to see the circumstances and how to complain about all of that. We'll talk more about that later. Now, how does he know that in some way he will be delivered? And how does he know that in whatever way things come to pass, that Christ will be magnified, that Christ will be exalted? Well, the answer is in verse 21. For, because for me to live is Christ and to, get, to die is gain. That is, that either way, life or death, will, will, be, will bring Christ glory because He has made His life Christ. Now, His death will be gain. And as we get closer to the end of the lesson, I want to think about how Christ can be glorified even in Paul's death. But right now, I want to think about is the kind of life that Paul said he had been living so that he could be confident that in his body, Christ will be glorified. And I think the letter of Philippians is a call to them for them to live in a way that Christ will be glorified in their bodies, whether by life or by death. And what he does is immediately after that, in verse 27, he goes right from verse 25, I know that I will continue and remain with you so that you're, for your progress in joining the faith, Verse 27, he immediately transitions, only live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So he immediately transitions from his, his circumstances and what he hopes to accomplish, what he will accomplish in life or in death, and says you need to live in a way that matches the calling to which you have been called, that matches the gospel. 
that, that when you put it on the scales, and here's the gospel call, the, 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 the message of King Jesus, and His authority, and His power, and His forgiveness, and all that's on one side, and here are your lives being weighed against it on the other side, that your lives match or in step with what you have been called to. And I, so I want to think about the kind of life in which Christ is glorified. And I think Paul gives us that here. And I want to start in chapter 2 and verse 1, where kind of wrapping up that introduction and moving forward to his first kind of major call to the Philippians, he says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, and I think basically what Paul is saying there is, is if we have any connection here, and if you have any interest in building one another up, and if you have any partnership and fellowship in the Spirit, then, verse 2, fulfill my joy that you think the same way by maintaining the same love, being united in Spirit, thinking on one purpose, doing nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves." Not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The first major thing to which Paul calls the Philippians is that they would live a life of humble service. If you want to glorify Christ in your body while you're alive, you devote yourself to the humble service of one another. And I think that most of all, this is carried out in the context of a local congregation. I don't think that's, that, that, that it's, it's exhausted in that. But I would say that he's calling upon the Philippians, for, for sure, to be united together, to think together, to love together, to be united together by doing nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but considering each other as more important than themselves. Putting others ahead of ourselves by pursuing unity, working together, loving one another. And what you have is rather than a, a situation where folks are stepping on each other in order to get places of prominence. You have a, an, a situation where people are, are pushing each other up in order to give them prominence in their own thinking. And if we want to live lives, if we want to be a place, if we want to be a congregation where Christ is glorified, that's, that's the environment that it has to be. And if it's not that, Christ won't be glorified, we will be glorified. If we're pursuing a place where we get the places of prominence because we think we deserve them, then Christ will not be honored by our life. And He won't be honored by our death. We can't have any hope of it. But in a situation where we're pushing everybody else up and saying, no, you go first. No, you look at, look at them. Look at what they're doing. Look at the work they're doing. Let me help you. When we're doing that then Christ can be glorified. Now, how, do, how does that magnify Christ? It magnifies Christ because it is the way of Christ. It is taking, verse 5, the mind of Christ and making it our own. We show the world that we, we fully have bought in to Christ's pattern and His way of doing things because we live that out every day among one another. Verse 5, have this way of thinking, have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. He didn't, he didn't feel like he had to clutch on to that. We feel like, I think sometimes we have to hold on to whatever status or position we have because I've got this and if I let this go, then what? Jesus lets it go. He didn't feel like that status had to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And, and I know you're good Bible students. You know where all this is headed. Just put a pen in it for a second. Because what I want to focus on is that by, by accepting this way, we are demonstrating to the world that we have embraced Christ's mind and His way. And, and, and this brings glory to Christ because it is so countercultural. And it is countercultural in every culture. This was countercultural in the first century. It is countercultural in the 21st century. And I, just as a side note, I think this is one of the great dangers when we look at the Bible and we say, well, Paul wrote that because, you know, that was what was in line with this culture. 
So much of what Paul wrote was so out of step with his culture. And if we start trying to make the judgments of what was that culture and what was our culture, basically just throw it all out because it doesn't fit in any culture. And, uh, and if we're trying to make the New Testament fit to our culture, then that's not the way any of this works. But we're pointing what we're doing, the way it glorifies Christ, is because we are pointing people away from us and we're pointing people to his body and we're pointing people to him. And, uh, and, and the goal is to, for people to give him glory. Now, Paul gives examples of this humble service in chapter 2. I think he puts himself forward as an example. And you might say, well, how can you be an example of humble service and then put, your, put yourself forward as an example of humble service? Well, Paul can do whatever he wants, right? Um, in, in 2, 17 and 18, he says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And you also rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So Paul says, even if what's happening here is I am dying and that drink offering will be the thing kind of poured out on the sacrifice at the end, even if this is kind of the last amount of the sacrifice of what I have done in the service of you being Christ's, then I rejoice in that. So he puts forward himself as somebody who has literally, in one way, poured himself out as a sacrifice for them. And you might even think back up in chapter 1 where he says that he's preaching the gospel and people are trying to do it out of bitterness and strife. And he says, I don't care. I'm just glad the gospel is being proclaimed. And I think he is point, putting himself forward as an example of humble service. And, and not, not as, a, as a person who is doing that arrogantly, but as a person who has said, and he'll show us in chapter 3, who will say, I had to learn this way too. Right? I, I, had, I had to walk down a tough road to get here too. And he doesn't say it as somebody who's standing back watching everybody else do it, but somebody who has endured this and is now saying, hey, come with me. And that's not arrogant. That's not pride. That is, that's, it's like a father, it's a mentor grabbing onto somebody and saying, you can come with me too. So he puts himself forward. He puts Timothy forward as an example of this service. So he says, I'm going to send Timothy, verse 20, for I have no one else of kindred spirit, this is chapter 2, verse 20, who will genuinely be concerned about your circumstances, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. I like the parallel there that he makes between saying, they, he will be concerned about your circumstances because he is interested in the interest of Christ Jesus. You see that parallel? And both of them, like Timothy's not at the center. He's not concerned about his own interest. He's concerned about their circumstances. He's not concerned about his own interest, but those of Jesus Christ. The Philippians and their faith was Christ's interest. And there were too many people who were selfishly ambitious that they thought they could take advantage of that situation. And Paul says, not Timothy. Timothy will come, and he is genuinely concerned about you. Um, and then you've got Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus is the kind of man who I long to be because he was sick to the point of death, verse 27. But back in verse 26, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. Epaphroditus was upset that people would be upset that he was sick. And he didn't want them to have to worry about that. And so, in verse 30, he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to fulfill what was lacking in your service to me. And I don't think what he's saying there is because of the stuff you wouldn't do, but maybe the stuff you couldn't do. Maybe the stuff you weren't in a position to do. And here is Epaphroditus, and he is serving, and he's serving so much that he almost dies. Now, Paul gives examples of this life of humble service. But what I want you to see in this is just at some point go through and see how many times Christ is mentioned in all of that. Even though these men are being put forward as examples of humble service, they're pointing people to Jesus all the time by the life that they're living because they have adopted Christ's way. They have Christ's mind in them. They have that they are living in the way of Christ. All right, so first, a life of humble service. And second, a life of earthly sacrifice. This is a way, this is the way 
that we glorify Christ in our body, that we make Him large. Look at chapter 3, and, and, and I'll summarize verses 1 through 6. Basically, there are those who take pride in their fleshly accomplishments, in their position. And Paul says, if we're lining up resumes, mine lines up just as well. But I want to key in beginning in verse 7. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God upon faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Why, why would Paul be willing to count these things, the things that are mentioned basically in verses 5 and 6, why would he be willing to count those things as loss? These are things that from a worldly standpoint, at least within the Jewish world, were of high value. And why write them off? Why just say, why be willing uh, to count these things as laws? Because, as Paul says here, they don't count in the grand scheme of things. If you look at the big picture, these things aren't worth anything, really. Verse 11, he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's the thing that really matters. That's the thing that really counts. And if something doesn't help us to that end, it can be cast aside without concern. And especially if it's holding us back from the resurrection of the, of, from the dead. If there's something that's standing in the way from me attaining to the resurrection of life, and, and I throw that away, I haven't lost really anything. Um, Paul's sacrifices of earthly things make perfect sense in line with his understanding of what's waiting for him. There, there's a, a saying, so there was a... Um, a man who went to, I think it was to the Amazon rainforest to preach to people who had never heard about Jesus, never heard the gospel. And he went to preach to them and he was killed basically upon arrival. And in his journal, he wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. One more time. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And that is true. I, so let, let's use Paul. He would never be able to keep all of those statuses that he has in verse 5 anyway. Because they had just become fleshly markers. That's all they were. It's not all they ever were, right? It was important, circumcision, all those things. But by the time of Paul's days, all, all they were were status symbols. And Paul says, I could never keep those anyway. So what if I write them off 20 years early, 30 years early, right? So what if we lose everything here if we have attained to the resurrection from the dead? Because we can't keep one bit of it anyway. All right, so in following Christ, you are going to make sacrifices, you're going to make sacrifices. I am sure that many of you have had to make financial decisions that if you weren't devoted to Christ, you might could have made a different decision on your career choice or on investments you would have made or on maybe it, maybe it's just on the level of commitment that you gave to whatever financial remuneration you were getting or whatever. And you've made different choices. Okay, you made a sacrifice there. Some of you will have had to make sacrifices maybe in the fun and entertainment and enjoyment of the pleasure of this world. Yes, you will have to sacrifice those things. But in the grand scheme of all of it, those are rubbish. They are trash 
They are garbage in comparison with knowing Christ Jesus our Lord and attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Right? So there's no, I'm not trying to tell you this morning that you're not going to have to make sacrifices. You are. What I'm trying to tell you is that you're going to lose those things anyway. You are going to die. And that if you will go ahead and sacrifice them now, if you will lose what you couldn't keep anyway, you can gain something that you will never lose and that will far exceed all of those things that you, that you lost. I, I love what's said about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, that he gave up the passing pleasures of sin, which is the Hebrew writer's you know, kind of acknowledgement that there are passing pleasures of sin. But he gave up the passing pleasures of sin because he considered the reproaches of Christ to be of greater value. To be, of, to be of greater worth. Now, over in, in verse 17, Paul will talk about some other people. He said, Join in following my example, and look for those who walk in according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even crying, as enemies of the cross of Christ. What does it look like for somebody to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? You would imagine with picket signs. No, 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 no. Look at verse 19. Whose end is destruction whose God is their stomach and glory is in their shame, who set their thoughts on earthly things. You see, the people who are enemies of the cross of Christ look a lot like us and maybe our friends and neighbors who are probably decent moral people but who just have their minds set on earthly things. They never think higher than, than below the sun. But that's not us. Verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by working through which He is able to subject even all things to Himself. We're looking forward. We're pursuing Christ. And so if we have to sacrifice everything here, if our life is taken here, we have the expectation of Him transforming our body. Now, we don't have time to talk about it, but this is the secret to contentment, too. In chapter 4, Paul's going to talk a lot about um, not being anxious and letting the peace of God, uh, which surpasses all comprehension, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In, in chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, he'll talk about being content in plenty and in want and being able to do anything in Christ. Why? Because if this is really true, right, that I can't keep all this anyway, but that Christ is offering me something that I cannot lose, then what, what, what's there to be anxious about? What, what's the, I, I think that the only thing that Paul, we would say he's anxious about, he talks about in 2 Corinthians 11, the daily pressure of all the churches. Right? I, I think we would say Paul was anxious about the souls of other folks because he couldn't, he couldn't control that, he couldn't manage that. But as far as it came for himself... What would we say Paul had anxiety about? Being without? No. Danger? No. Death? I don't, think, I don't think he was anxious about any of that. He was anxious for the Philippians and what he would leave behind and if they would maintain their course. But as far as for himself and for his sake, he has the peace of God which surpasses understanding and it guards his heart and mind. Why? Because he knew that he had already written off as garbage all of the things that would keep him to attain from attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And then in, in light of that, in earthly circumstances, so what? So what? I have the thing that counts the most. Now, how is Christ glorified? He is glorified because in our lives He is made large. He is magnified over things or status or whatever. He is, we, we, we show the world, Christ matters more to me than whatever else you could offer. You know, so, so we have this group of friends and they're involved in some fleshly, content, fleshly enjoyment, fleshly pleasure, and we say no, and they say why not, and we say because Christ is bigger than that to me. And, and here's a financial opportunity, but it, it will cause us to go down a road that will cost us our soul. And we say, no. And somebody says, why not? And we say, because Christ is honored in my life, not riches. That, that's how Christ is exalted in that way. He is magnified. We exalt Him in our lives over every earthly pursuit. And so, let me ask as we try to draw to a close, could you and I say 
that in our lives Christ is glorified, that He's made large, that He's exalted, that He's magnified? Are we humbly serving one another? Are we sacrificing any and all things for the sake of Christ? I believe that somebody says, well, how do I make Christ large in my life? Well, you make Christ large in your life. That's how you do it. How do I magnify Him in your life? You magnify Him in your life. I know I'm saying the same thing. You make His people large in your life, which is, I think, maybe the primary means by which you make Him large in your life. And that's going to make us stand out in the world. Paul talks about that in chapter 2, that we would shine as lights in the world. When we serve and when we sacrifice and we do so without grumbling or disputing, then we will shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And that will point people to Christ. And He will be glorified in our bodies. Now Paul also says that He will be magnified, that Christ will be magnified in His death too. How? Well, first of all, it's the ultimate demonstration of those two points, service and sacrifice. Right? Like I can, I can talk a lot about service and sacrifice. And then he says in verse chapter 2, 17, he says, I'm poured out as a drink offering for you. Right? He, he lays down his life. And why is he in prison in the first place? For the Philippians and for people like the Philippians because he was preaching to them. Um, putting others' interest ahead, Paul says, even if it takes my life. So it's the ultimate outgrowth of that. It is the ultimate outgrowth of that, that idea of wanting Christ more than anything else. Look, look at chapter 3 and verse 10. He says... Being conformed, the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. Paul says to be like Christ and to be with Christ is more important to me than anything else, so much so that I am ready to follow him in the pattern even of his death. I want to be conformed even to the sufferings. I want to be conformed even to the death. And so when difficult times came, to Paul, when death came to Paul, he could say, that's okay, this will help me be more like Jesus. Because I can be conformed to the image of his death. <laughs> conformed, conformed to his death, so that I can attain to the resurrection. I, I do want to note, just really quickly, over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So this is um, Paul's second imprisonment. And... Um, I say second imprisonment, his second Roman imprisonment. And, and, and things do not look as hopeful as far as an earthly deliverance in this one. In fact, we believe that he would be killed basically at the end of this, this, uh, this sentence. And in verse 16, he says, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Verse 17, But the Lord stood with me. And strengthen me, so that through me the preaching might be fulfilled, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. So when he talks about being rescued in verse 17, I think he's saying, I was delivered from that imprisonment, I was able to get out, I was able to preach, first of all, to the highest, highest levels of Roman power, and then I was able to fulfill my ministry of the Gentiles. And then look at verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. So, does he expect to get out of this one? I don't think so. And will save me unto his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, I, I don't know that he expects to get out of this one, but he knows it's a possibility he won't get out of this one. And he doesn't get out of this one if we understand correctly the historical timeline. And so what Paul says is, the Lord will rescue me. He will deliver me. How do you know? Because he always has. And because Christ is glorified in my body. So I, I think that Paul's service and sacrifice, if you take that to the end of the line, where does that end up? Well, in a world that hates what that service and sacrifice point to, you're going to be poured out as a drink offering. You're going to have to be conformed to his death in one way or the other. Now, I, the second way that I think that this magnifies Christ is because it points to the exaltation of Christ, ultimately. 
Because I mentioned way back in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, that Jesus didn't hold on to that status. And he let it go, and he empties himself, and he takes on the form of a slave, and he humbles himself, he, and he's obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Look at verse 9. Therefore, as a result of hum his humiliation, as a result of his obedience, as a result of his humble service and sacrifice, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What Paul does in dying is he embraces that God's way of working in the world is suffering and then glory. Suffering and then glory. Suffering and then glory. It's true all the way through. And it is true in Christ. And as Christians, we embrace suffering to glory. And we say, we accept that the glory won't be here. That it will be suffering here. But glory there. And when we stand in the face of death, when we stand in the face of whatever sacrifice, and when we stand in the face of death, and we say, bring it. Because this is the suffering part, and I'm ready for the glory part. Then we glorify Christ in our bodies because He is the ultimate demonstration of that. He is the ultimate exaltation. He's the ultimate sufferer, and He's the one who has been ultimately exalted to God's right hand. Let me say this as we close. That if our ultimate concern is the glory of Christ, then He will be magnified in us in life or in death. And then, then our lives will be Christ. And dying, even that, will be gain. We're going to sing a song. And if you have not embraced Christ today. Do it today. Won't you come while we stand for the Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.